you know, this is a great opportunity for you guys. I know you guys a lot are coming from other different cities. There's no place like playing in New York. There's no place like winning here. So uh, you guys have a great opportunity, man, and be stronger than your excuses. And uh, let's break it down, guys. Yes, sir. Giants on three, ready? One, two, three, Giants! Giants. The temperature is in the mid 80s here in East Rutherford, New Jersey, and it's time for the Giants training camp report presented by Citizens. We begin practice day number three as Big Blue continues to ramp up for the preseason. Hi again, everybody. I'm Paul Dottino along with Super Bowl champion Amani Toomer. So glad you could join us for another session of Big Blue football. Now, today the players are in shells. Coach Brian Dable had them in shorts and helmets the first couple of practices, Amani. But this is all part of the coach's ramp up process. Explain to the folks exactly the reasoning behind that and how the players feel about it. Well, I would, if I was a player, I'd think that it'd be a great idea because you're always going to lose somebody in the first couple days just because they're in shape. But being in shape uh, is not the same as being in football shape. And being in football shape, you've got to get used to the motions that you're going to do, like used to the explosive nature of, of the moves that you have to do. So doing that with a little bit less intensity to allow the body to adapt is a great idea. And I wish they would have done that more back in the day. They used to just throw us in the fire and, and, uh, and see, you know, see who survived. So it's one of those things where science and, uh, and, and, and the modern training methods are really catching up and showing itself in these types of uh, situations. We're getting a look right now as uh, the Giants are lining up to snap the football. They will be in full pads on Monday. That'll be the first time they actually get in full gear during practice. Daniel Jones here on a sprint out. And once we get to Monday, you'll see more contact. Yeah, contact is something that um, it's really not emphasized as much in training camp as it once was. And, and the game really, you know, if you're in this camp, you can take the contact. You, you can deliver the blows sufficient enough to play in this game. Now, it's all about mental. I always thought camp was more mental than anything else. How focused can you stay when you're tired? How can you think and, and, and execute plays at a high level when you physically aren't at 100%? Coach Brian Dable has talked about one of the keys to what they're trying to do here during the early days of camp is that he wants to see Daniel Jones get in and out of the huddle cleanly run quick tempo plays and make sure he makes clean, crisp, correct decisions. As we get another look here, a pass to Wondell Robinson, the Giants' second-round pick. Uh, could you translate to the folks exactly what he's talking about? Well, he just wants him to show command of the offense. I mean, there's one thing to know the offense when you're in a classroom setting, and then there's another thing to know the offense when you got people coming at you, you're sweaty, you're hot. You know, you know, it's not ideal situations for somebody to think your heart rate's up. So now being able to think, being able to execute, being able to demonstrate not just an understanding of the offense, but a mastery. And I think that's what he's trying to get at. One of the other things that's been a big topic of training camp, and since you're a wide receiver, this is going to be near and dear to your heart, is that there's a lot of pre-snap motion yeah. and an awful lot going on with this offense before that ball actually gets into the quarterback's hands, how difficult is that for wide receivers to be able to understand what they have to do, get the timing right, get the right reads right? It's not difficult at all. If you take the game seriously and you understand that these motions are just opportunities for you and your uh, offense to exploit and get a clue, a clue on what the defense is trying to dictate to you, you can use it as an advantage is what I'm trying to say. Now, one thing we definitely know is important, and Coach also has stressed this, I need to get reps with these guys so that they find the chemistry. They got to they gotta learn each other's tempo. They got to learn each other's idiosyncrasies. We just saw Tyrod Taylor throwing a long pass down the right sideline a moment ago. Uh, at what point does that start to gel? Does that start to mesh between a quarterback and his targets? It's all, it varies. Sometimes it's immediate. Sometimes it takes months. I remember when I played with Kerry, it was immediate. Like we had an immediate connection. And then you play, play with other quarterbacks with Eli. It took me a little bit longer to get that connection. So it's all depends. But the only way you're going to get that connection is repping it out 
in training camp over and over again, and, and those are the only, that's the only way you're going to get that comfort level. There's no other way you can do that. Davis Webb, the Giants' third-string quarterback, now at the controls as the Giants continue with some of their passing drills today. This will be a day where they primarily focus on third and longs. Oh. So we're going to see a lot of pass plays like this one right here. Uh, the Giants trying to stress both their offense and defense with difficult situations, difficult situational setups. That was Antonio Williams, the running back who came over from the Bills. I tell you what, third down is what is going to separate a good offense from a great offense, a good quarterback from a great quarterback. Great quarterbacks are paid for third downs in the red zone. And so this is a very good window into what kind of quarterback and what kind of offense we're going to be running this year. So it's just going to be a good day to come out and actually see and uh, get kind of a, a glimpse into what we got for this Giants this year, this, uh, this Giants team. Well, as they run these snaps, what do you think the most important thing the staff is looking at? Is it, is it about are the adjustments being made properly? Uh, are the blocks being made properly? What's the primary thing that they need to see? You need to see that everybody's on the same page. They need to see cohesiveness. They need to see that, you know, if you're going to supposed to run a route at, at, you know, at seven yards, you're getting that seven yards, and the quarterback knows you're going to get the seven yards. You can see what it looks like when those two things come together. And this is only the third day, but, you know, there's not many days in the modern training camp where you can see what – you're, what, what you're going to actually see closer to what you're actually going to see during the during the game. We won't see the Giants in their first preseason game until August the 11th up in Foxborough as Davis Webb again drops off a pass in the flat as the Giants take on the Patriots. Again, that is two weeks from yesterday. Mm. So they've got a number of practices until then. Gary Brightwell, you see the running back who was drafted as a rookie last year, primarily as a special teams player. So they've got some time yet to work out a bunch of kinks. I wonder how you would feel, though, as a wide receiver, trying to get down this new offense, going up against a Wick Martindale defense. We know about his history coming from Baltimore. He's going to give you a lot of looks, and you have to be able to make adjustments. I would love it because I want everything in practice harder than it is going to be during the game. And when you're looking at all these different looks, all these different, um, uh, you know, protections that you have to adjust for you're going to know that in the game you're not going to see anything diff more difficult than this and I remember playing against the Ravens and their off their defense has always been very confusing with the three four that they run and you know it, the pre-snap reads are important that's why motion is important because it lets you know who's going to be the guy who's going to drop who's going to be the rusher just by the fact that when you're moving around it's harder to kind of disguise uh, than when you're staying static at the offense at the line so it seems to me you do buy that philosophy that orange sharpens iron because you've got a lot of motion going on offense to confuse the D, but you also have a lot of motion on D trying to confuse the offense. Absolutely. And this is the kind of thing mentally, this mental gamesmanship yeah. seems to be something that you think they should get used to. Absolutely, because, you know, you, you, offensive coordinators and defensive coordinators, they have their little game between them, you know, in terms of statistics, not statistics, in terms of strategies between them. But it doesn't matter unless the players on the field understand what they have to do to where you can put the offensive coordinator in a position to, to, to make adjustments. You can't make adjustments if your team can't figure out what they have to do. So getting to a point where you get on the same page with the offense coordinator is very important in terms of, you know, allowing him the comfort that he can make adjustments during the game and, 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 and use his use a strategy to, you know, to go against what the defense coordinator is trying to do. We just got a chance to see Kenny Galladay make a play before uh, the, this particular part of practice ended. Galladay is a guy who has had 2,000-yard seasons. He's been to a Pro Bowl. Giants brought him in last year. They expect huge things from him. How do you see his role under the new administration's offense? Oh, he's got to be the number one. I'm looking for big things for Galladay. I'm rooting for him. I hope he's going to be the guy that he, you know, nobody wants to see anybody fail. And uh, I, I, I really like what he's done in when he was in Detroit. But playing in Detroit, where the interest is moderate, let's just say to be nice, then to playing in New York, where everybody is looking at every single thing you do. And that's how New York fans are. They want to push you to make sure that they know you're tough enough 
to see it through to the other side. And I think everybody's rooting for Galladay, but they're not going to make it easy for you because this isn't a tough, this is a tough town. And, um, you know, we want tough people. and We want our, our athletes to be as tough as the people that live in this city. One of the other guys who's really shown up here during the offseason is veteran Richie James, former San Francisco 49er, sat out last year with a knee injury. But because of his versatility, he's suddenly a guy who's kind of in the mix. Absolutely. Whenever you can get a guy who can not only do be a third down receiver but and spell all the different receivers uh, from one to uh, that one and two, but also play special teams. That is a key. Return man is one of the keys to having a playoff team. You have to have a punt return that's going to give you three or four first downs a game that will just put things over the top if you're playing against a team where that is evenly matched. A couple first downs uh, less that you have to get during a game could, uh, uh, could put you over the top. We always talk about how if you're deeper on the depth chart as you get a look at James, James, a kick returner, is particularly very successful when he was with the 49ers. If you're going to be the fourth or fifth or sixth wide receiver on the roster, you absolutely have to be able to give them something on special teams. Absolutely, and not just returning. Sometimes you have to cover some kicks. You have to be a guy, a jack of all trades, because you know they're going to be asking you to do a lot of things and to stay on the roster you're going to have to you know, put your hand up and say, yes, coach, I can do that. The Giants, it seems to me, have such a wide variety of ways to throw this football. Whether it's to the receivers, yes, they're dynamic. But they've got some tight ends who are showing good hands. They've got running backs who have good hands. And I think that's one of the things that excites this staff because they can give you such a variety of looks and I don't even know if guys are going to be in their traditional positions because they can all play everywhere. Well, that's the modern NFL. I mean, you got to be able to do a lot of things because if the lining up, you know, with I formation, two tight ends, you, there are times for that in, you know, in short yards and stuff. But in terms of moving the ball, teams score so prolifically now that you're going to have to put the ball in the air, take some chances down the field. And you can't do that with an average quarterback. You can't do that with an average offensive line. And you can't do that with average skill positions. Let's talk a little bit about not only the receivers who can, of course, catch all kinds of wide receiver screens, but the running backs can also be very important facets to those flare outs, those dump offs, and they can even get downfield further and be pseudo wide receivers, if you will. Uh, that's the modern NFL. You have to have that. You can't just be the bruiser. You have to be able to do more than one thing to keep defenses off, off balance. Let's talk about Saquon Barkley. Yeah. 91 catches as a rookie when he had over 2,000 yards from scrimmage. I don't know if he's going to catch more yards as a receiver out of the backfield or if he's going to rush for more yards as a running back. But Amani, I think in this offense, he could be a 1,000, a 1,000 guy doing both. He could be. But, you know, that was with 16 games. You got, to get the, you got the extra game now. It's 17. So maybe he got to be a 1,200, 1,200 guy. But, um... When I look at Saquon, there's nothing he can't do. He can go, he can line up outside. He can do, we can run from the backfield. He can do anything, so he can be a return guy. He's like having two different, two players in one. But the only thing that everybody, the elephant in the room when you're talking about uh, Saquon Barkley is can he stay healthy? From what I'm hearing, he's focused, he's training well, he's, you know, he's, he's a contract year, so it's a make or break for him. And I would love to see athletes with the ability that he has with a little bit of pressure on his back because that type of pressure creates diamonds. You're a guy who was a wide receiver. He is a guy who is a running back who does some wide receiver things. Could you examine for me his skill set and what as a wide receiver you see that makes him a good threat in the passing game? His change of direction. The fact that he can get off the line of scrimmage the fact that he can run full speed, stop, turn to change direction, and maintain, and get back to full speed very quickly because of his explosiveness makes him, it just separates him from everybody else. Most big guys don't have the feet that he has. Most big guys can't um, move laterally as well as he can. And that's what makes him, set, makes him different. He's bigger, he's just as fast, and he can move just like a guy 30 pounds less than him. Let me ask you something a little bit offbeat, but I think it's important to understand because 
Like when Tom Coughlin was here, he used to say all the time, my receivers need to block. Yes. You better be able to block for that running game or you probably are not going to play. So how about the mentality that some of these receivers have to have for these running backs, understanding that Saquon Barkley is going to run the ball a lot, and you better be able to clear some paths for him around the edge. Hey, you know, it's you got to block. Like that's part of the – you have to be a, on the team. To be a team player is to block. Wide receivers block for running backs when they're running the ball. Running backs block for receivers in pass protection. So it's a thing that you have to do. It's not something that – it's not optional. Uh, if you want to have a winning team, you got to have your best players sacrificing as much as uh, more than everybody else in terms of blocking because that just sets the tone for the rest of the receiver room and for the rest of the team. It's a mentality you have to have. You have to have. I mean, it's teams. It's a team sport. If you don't want to block, then you know you could be a uh, you could do something else, be an MMA fighter by yourself. You know, this is this is a team sport, and you have to hold your weight, and you're not always going to be the guy that everybody celebrates. That's just that's part of football. Gary Brightwell just found some room there around the edge. No doubt there was a receiver block. Uh, I think the other thing that I'm very curious about from your perspective as a receiver who was so accomplished over the course of time, how much can you help not only those guys but the quarterback? Because you will see some things on the outside and then come back after a play, Davis Webb rolling out and firing, yep. that you can tell them, hey, when I did this motion or I saw this look, this is what I got from my DB. How much of that give and take has to go on? There has to be a significant amount because, you know, sometimes you'll see something that he can't see because he's, you know, like on the backside of a play. You say, oh, I can get outside on this guy. That will, you know, that will could place itself out later on in the game. They could come back to it and say, hey, you said you can get outside on this play. That is how the, the adjustments are made. Um, you need to tell the, you know, you got to also – Make plays for it. If your quarterback's struggling, he throws the ball that's a little high. You can't throw your arms up and be like, "Oh, I couldn't catch it." Sometimes you got to go out and, you know, risk the drop to give your quarterback an opportunity and make a play that probably shouldn't have been made because your quarterback wasn't as accurate as he wants to to get his juices going, to get his confidence going. So, you know, you definitely have to pick your quarterback up. He's not going to make the, the correct throw all the time. He, sometimes he's going to throw the ball in the wrong spot. You still have to give give him confidence that hey, I know this guy is on my side, and he's gonna make he's gonna go the extra mile to make a play for me if I give him an opportunity. I have to pick up on what you just said about when guys need to get corrected. Coach Dable said you have to get to know a guy really well, and you have to know how he responds to corrections, and you can't just physically get on a guy for making a mistake. Because during training camp, there are going to be mistakes. Absolutely. And you have to be able to relate to the guy on a personal level so that he can absorb your teachings. Yeah, because if you yell at somebody or you t you go you cross a line with somebody, they're going to shut off. And at the, at the end of the day, as a, your job as a coach is to get the most out of everybody. And so you got to figure out what's going what's gonna to get through to that player. Sometimes there's players that they are so in their own head and they're so afraid of making mistakes that you don't have to say anything to him. You could just say, hey, you know you made a mistake on that play. And he'll be like, yeah, I know I did. Because he's already thinking about it in his own head. And if you, you yell at him, he's going to lose confidence. And one thing a coach can't do is kill a player's confidence. And that's what makes great coaches, good coach separates good coach from great coaches. Good coaches, you know, will just point out the obvious. Great coaches will point out the obvious in a way that's palatable to that specific player. Right. So that they won't lose that player because, you know, maybe that player has the most ability. You never know. So you got to mentally be able to connect with all these different players on their level. And that's what that's what great coaches can do. How far along at this particular time do you think the players are in terms of their familiarity and understanding what the playbook says they are supposed to do? Now, we know that the muscle memory and the reactions may not be precise because they still have to get into the flow and gel. But mentally, how close do you think they are to doing the correct installs that they'll use during the season? You have to be there. You have to be there going into training camp. You can't go into training camp thinking and, and figuring out new things. Mini camp, um, OTAs, all that is where you learn, right? So when you're coming to training camp, it's got to be very, very close to muscle memory. The worst thing you can try to do is go to training camp trying to learn new things because you, you don't sleep that well. 
you know, it's stressful. You know, you're trying to impress. You can't impress when you're thinking. You can only impress through muscle memory. So if you have, if you don't know it by now or have a firm grasp on it right now, you're behind the eight ball trying to catch up. Another thing that came out of this morning's presser with Coach Dable is that at the end of yesterday's practice, he actually allowed some of the players to call the plays, which is very unique. Uh, for example, Mike Kafka, the offensive coordinator, has been calling the plays on offense all along, but at the end of yesterday, not so much. Coach said it's important that the players understand that responsibility. We see Darnay Holmes with an interception here as he takes it back for a pick six, uh, saying that the players need to understand that sometimes the operation won't go right, and they're going to have the responsibility. Don't have to panic and to make sure things go the way they need to go. Yeah, I, this new school football is not, <laughs> I, 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 I can't really comment on it. I always was just, uh, you make everything work. I, I, so Coach Coughlin wasn't going to do that. Yeah, Coach Coughlin wasn't like, hey, Monty, what do you want to run today? <laughs> I'd have been like, I want to run a go. You know? <laughs> but uh, who knows? But hey, you know, this is, this is, uh, this is the modern NFL, man. I should ask you about Darnay Holmes since that's the, uh, I think the third pick he might have had so far during the course of training camp. Uh, this is a guy who out of UCLA yep. uh, probably has a leg up on being one of the starting DBs because we do include the nickel as a starting DB these days. It's such a passing game. What do you see in Holmes that makes him a good cover guy? Well, I just like the fact that, you know, he can catch. I, always tell, I used to always tell, you know, guys, the difference between a good quarterback and a great quarterback is a good cornerback will knock the ball down and get a pass breakup. Great cornerbacks is, you know, putting the offense on the field by catching the ball. So I feel like if you can catch, that just gives you a, such a leg up on the other DBs because the turnover ratio in the NFL equates to wins. So you turn in for a, play, a guy just, you know, getting a punt, getting the, other, the opposing team to punt on third down, to give in your offense the short field, that's a huge difference. Right. Tyrod Taylor now getting an opportunity out of play action pass and finds a short target out of the backfield. As we get ready to wrap things up here, looking at some final snaps from today's edition of the program, the tempo, the ability for the guys to get lined up quickly and to snap the ball in a rapid pace, that's one thing that they, the coaching staff will not compromise on. Yeah. They do want these guys to understand, go, 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 go. Even if they're not running long routes, they do want to get things done quickly. Yeah, because it's harder for a defense to disguise and play around with you if they know you're going to snap the ball quickly. If you line up and snap, they have to line up, they, and, they get, and they get used to it, they have to line up in what they're showing you or they're going to be out of position at the snap. So that's another advantage that you get from a pre-snap read. You get the motion. That helps, gives you an advantage, gives you a look into what they're trying to do, and you get the ball snapped quickly. That also makes the defense dictate what they're doing, and they can't mess around as much. Because we used to line up at the line of scrimmage with Eli his rookie year, and we were in um, we were in Baltimore, and they were moving around constantly, mm -hmm. and Eli didn't know what they were doing because they knew they had time because they knew we weren't going to snap the ball quickly to mess around with us. And it's just one of those situations you have to get the ball snapped quickly to that, that not let that defense play around with you. Well, we're about to wrap it up. You got a few snaps left in you? You want to go out? I, I've lost a little bit of weight. Maybe I can do No, heck no, I can't get out there. This is this game has passed me by, and I, I'm, I'm enjoying being a fan watching uh, these guys go through this training camp. For Super Bowl champion Imani Toomer, I'm Paul DeTito. This has been the Giants Training Camp Report presented by Citizens. So long, everybody.